Alright, so I got a great comment here. I got a couple of great comments here I want to share and go over you with. All right, an ounce of salt per day says, How can you possibly say that the Bible does not say that there will be a thousand year reign with Christ? Revelation 20 verse 4 states very specifically and I saw thrones and they sat upon I well I read I'll read this again why are you denying this passage exists now let's read here I think he's got a half a book here that's okay because I appreciate these so let's go over each one first at the end of the book of Revelation the heavenly Jerusalem descends to earth where those that the Heavenly Father chooses dwell with Him on earth. Also, I am not claiming that Jesus only reigns for a thousand years. Revelation says that Satan is locked up for a thousand years and then he is loosed for a season. The Bible is silent about who is in charge during that time. <laughs> but I agree with you that Christ is still the King. Oh even when Satan is loosed to deceive. The early biblical versions of Revelation write the Satan is loosed for a season. <clears throat> and then here perhaps this would be better addressed if you give us your deconstruction of Revelation 20 in particular Revelation 20 and Revelation I'm sorry Revelation 20 verse 4 and verse 7. All right, so, and then Richie here. I disagree with Richie here. I think it's closer to 100 videos, but he says I have about 30 videos on Chapter 20 and the Millennial Reign, breaking it down. Okay, so um, let's let's go over this. First of all, you know, um, just as an overview, it looks like you're making a big deal out of this Satan is loosed for a season. All right, this statement right here though, the early biblical versions of Revelation write the Satan is loose for a season. Uh, that statement right there tells me you don't believe in uh, the early versions. You don't believe in any version. You don't believe in the Bible at all. That's That's what it says to me. Well, why would you point to early biblical versions if you are if you have a standard already, right? And, and what's that mean? Early biblical versions. What, what version are you speaking of? So for me, I have one standard. It's the gold standard for the English language, and it's the King James Bible. It is perfect. There are no errors at all. Not even one. It is the perfect, pure Word of God. It is from God, and it's to us and for us in the English language. Now, I can't speak for other languages because I barely know English. But it's the only language I know. I don't know any other language. All right, and, and I could go over all that, too. The language is a very fascinating topic. But in the English language, the King James Bible is the gold standard. It is the perfect, pure Word of God. <clears throat> All right, so, and the perfect, pure Word of God says, loosed a little season, no big deal, who cares? Little season, loosed a little season, whatever. The key is understanding what this is talking about. Okay, so I want to go back to the very first comment here. And how can you possibly say that? The Bible does not say that there will be a thousand-year reign with Jesus. Just that reference alone suggests or implies that there is a that we're going to reign with Christ for a thousand years, or we're going to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. You got to get technical here. All right, we're going to reign with Jesus for a thousand years. That alone suggests that. When the thousand years are done, we don't reign with him no more. 
That's what it suggests. All right, so and I'm technically what I'm saying is, unless I've misspoken in that video, technically what I'm saying is that there is no thousand-year reign of Christ, or there's no a thousand-year reign of Jesus. I suppose if I got. If I got to get real specific, there is no thousand year reign of Jesus. Jesus reigns forever. And that's uh, clear all throughout the scripture, but Luke chapter 1, verse 33 ought to be able to uh, knock out any doubt that you might have. Speaking of Jesus, it says, He shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of, of his kingdom there shall be no end. So that right there disqualifies any notion or any idea <clears throat> that Jesus reigns 1,000 years. He doesn't. He reigns forever. All right, so you asked me to go over 4 through 7. And, of course, I've been uh, multiple, many, 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 many times. I've gone through this. And I saw thrones. So let's break this down here. I saw thrones. That means we are the ones that he sees. We are the ones that he sees sitting on our thrones. Why? Because Jesus has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father right now. Right now, we that are saved are kings. Right now, we that are saved are royalty. We read here in Exodus 19. And let me read here, verse 6. Here, Moses. Well, let me. Uh, how do I say this? Let me just say it this way. Mo excuse me. God said to Moses. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou, Moses, shall speak unto the children of Israel. Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Now let's go to First Peter 2. Alright, we're going to connect the dots here. Oh, did they remove that from the Bible? Oh, no. The old Mandela's at it again. Oh, no, there it is. Alright. Okay. In First Peter chapter 2, ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. A peculiar people. You see the connection there? Are you, are you connecting the dots here? God said to Moses, Ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. And here in 1 Peter chapter 2, Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God. So we that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ we are the children of God. We are the children of Israel. We are the people of God. Let's go to 1 John chapter 3. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. Right? Right now, we are the sons of God. He has made us sons of God right now. So, because we are sons of God, we are royalty. Royalty. So, we go to first, uh, I'm sorry, Revelation 1. First Revelation 1. Okay. And has made us king. Okay. If we go back to verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And the prince of the kings of the earth. 
unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. We're not earthly kings. We're spiritual kings. We're royalty. We are born of the Spirit of God and Jesus abides in us and we abide in him. If we're not kings, then he's not king. If he's not king, then we're not kings. Right? We are one in Christ Jesus. We are one in the Lord Jesus. He has made us kings. We're kings not because of us, but because of him. And he is the king of kings. <clears throat> All right? I think that's important to understand how important you are. Really. I, it's really it's disgraceful to say that you're not king and a priest. You're called to preach the gospel to every creature. You have been born of the Spirit of God. And why would you deny that? All right. So, um, so here in. Revelation 20 verse 4 and I saw thrones he's talking about us all right now we got to go back up to we got to understand the context and I saw an angel come down from heaven this is a vision that an angel is showing John go back to Revelation 1 verse 1 the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass and he sit and signified it by his angel unto his servant John so in Revelation 20 oh, nice that's fantastic and that beautiful beautiful okay so in Revelation 20 verse 1 it says I saw and I saw an angel come down from heaven that's another vision being shown to John All right, and then skip down to verse 4 and I saw thrones those thrones are us right now we don't sit on earthly thrones we sit on spiritual heavenly thrones right now and they sat upon them that's talking about us and judgment was given unto them judgment has already been given to us and that is everlasting life we are sealed we are saved we are secured we are sanctified forever nothing can take that away judgment has already been made for us it's been given to us and that's eternal life why because we are born of the Spirit of God Jesus is in us, he abides in us, and we abide in him. That cannot change. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. That's forever. Now, if you don't like it, I'm sorry, buddy. You're stuck, Chuck. You can't get out. You're saved, sealed, secured, sanctified forever. And if that you don't like it, well, my mom used to have an old saying, uh, tough titty, kitty. That's the way it is forever and ever. All right. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God. Now this is something that is happening during this time period. And we got evidence of that already. Uh, John being one clear example. Of he had his head cut off and he was hated because he was a witness of Jesus now and which had not worshipped the beast neither his image nor received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands all right so this is important I, you know because you got so many people that are teaching this futurist viewpoint this futurist worldview where they don't understand squat so they says come up with an easy answer and say oh that's gonna happen in the future the problem is when if Jesus comes tonight you know I'd like to be standing next to you 
when you explain to Jesus why he can't come back yet? I would love to hear that conversation. You going to tell him, well, the people haven't worshipped the beast yet. They didn't get the mark of the beast in their forehead yet. They didn't get the microchip yet. So you can't come back yet, Jesus. I would love to be standing next to you when you're having that conversation with the Lord Jesus Christ. Explain to him why he's got to go. He can't come back now. Uh, <laughs> that's a that's a bad spot to put yourself in. It really is. All right. So, it, first of all, it's important to understand who the beast is. It really is. If you're gonna understand this, you ought to understand who the beast is. You know, we we see in First Timothy or whatever Timothy. Somewhere in the Bible, it says, Study to show thyself approved. Study to show thyself approved. Second Timothy. I was way off. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Study. Oops. Study to show thyself approved. Study to show thyself approved. So here, when Revelation talks about the beast, what's it talking about? Well, this is you gotta. This is where you gotta connect the dots. The beast of Revelation is the fourth beast of Daniel. Make no mistake about it. All right. So if you understood the book of Daniel you would understand that he talks about four beasts and he says he describes these four beasts as four kings which shall arise out of the earth now Daniel names the first three beasts the first one being Babylon the second one being the Medes and the Persians the third one being the Greek Empire. He does not mention the fourth beast because the fourth beast had not come along yet to, uh, to attach a name to it. Now, we can figure out who the fourth beast is. All right, and as I pointed out in yesterday's video, um, it's during this uh, fourth beast or fourth kingdom that the Lord Jesus is killed all right so in Luke chapter 2 verse 1 and it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed right there that statement alone puts a, a that attaches a name to the fourth beast now, it's very important to understand that in the book of Daniel, when he talks about these four great beasts, the four, the f at, after the fourth beast, it's the end of the world. And of course, there's a new kingdom, an everlasting kingdom that is set up after. All right. So there's no way to get around it. The fourth beast of Daniel has to be the Roman Empire. Uh, you can't say the Roman Empire has vanished. It hasn't. If the Roman Empire had vanished, the fourth beast had vanished, if, it, if his kingdom was done away with, the, the next thing is left is the kingdom of Jesus, the kingdom of God, where there's an everlasting kingdom, a kingdom that will never end. So you cannot say the fourth beast has vanished. It hasn't. All right, so, I mean, it, it is so important to understand. I mean, Daniel, he talks about the fourth beast pretty good. Right? He says some pretty, some pretty good stuff that, that applies to the world we are in today. So here in Revelation 17, speaking of the beast, which is the fourth beast, the fourth kingdom which is the Roman Empire 
here it says when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is now how do you make sense of that well it's pretty simple the beast that was was the Roman Empire the physical Empire and is not so that physical Empire is not and yet is wasn't that interesting it's not but it is how is that how do you reconcile that there's only one way to reconcile that there's only one way to understand that there's only one way to interpret that and that's the Roman Empire went from a physical empire into a spiritual empire and what do we got here in, Re in uh, Revelation 17 the very the very first uh, verse here in Revelation 17 and there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me saying unto me come hither I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sits upon many waters whore you know what a whore is a whore is a like a prostitute or a woman that pretends to be the wife you know if she does things that the wife does but the whore is not the wife okay the whore is a wannabe a fake wife if you will all right so if you think of the bride of Christ as the church of God the whore is a fake bride of Christ you think of the wheat that's the good stuff the tares are the false wheat they look like wheat but they're not wheat and come harvest the wheat turned to golden brown and the tares their seeds turn black and become poisonous so also in Revelation 17 the whore is not the bride of Christ but she tries to look exactly like the bride of Christ and she tries to perform the duties as though she was the bride of Christ she is not the bride of Christ this alone tells us that this is a spiritual organization it's a, sp a spiritual entity if you will and so the Roman Empire transitions into a spiritual entity well what how could you apply that to what's going on today is there any spiritual entity that you could connect with the Roman Empire I'll give you a moment to think about it all right that's long enough there's this thing that is actually the most popular religion of the world today all right I'll give you just another minute to think about it who it might be but here notice here it says the great whore that sits upon many waters what's he talking about when he says that well, in verse 15 it says, And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, where the whore sits, are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. Is there anything in the world, any sort of spiritual entity in the world today, where they have people all over the world, peoples, multitudes in every nation and in every tongue or multiple at least at the very least multiple tongues and also as I shown you already is there anything known by that that we could connect to the Roman Empire that would fit this <laughs> I mean it's pretty obvious isn't it you can't get around that so you know like what we read in second Timothy it's, it's important to study to show thyself approved so that you might have understanding alright so we go back to Revelation 20 
and it talks about which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. So, now, this is important to understand. It really is. So, we understand who the beast is and who's in charge of, who's at the very top of that pyramid, if you will. All right. Now, you also got to understand, uh, you know, the what Daniel is talking about. How, I mean, we read about this in Isaiah and Jeremiah, all throughout the Bible, where the first beast is the Babylon Empire. All right, and, and again here we see that, and upon her forehead was a name written, mystery, Babylon the Great the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So the fourth beast of Daniel is in spirit of the first beast of Daniel, which is Babylon. Hey, there's no way to get around this. Okay. The beast of Revelation is the fourth beast of Daniel, which is in spirit of the first beast of Daniel. No way to get around it. Now, what is the beast of Daniel, or what is the beast of Revelation? What is the beast? Well, the beast is the world. All right, it's not of God, but of the world. It's a worldly kingdom, and it's of the world. So you don't have to be. Uh, how do you say this? Uh, Committed to the the whore. All right. If I can avoid saying exactly who the whore is, right? You don't have to actually be committed. You are by default committed to the whore because the whore is the worldly kingdom, and so by default you are committed to the world. You are of the world. So by default, because you don't put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you put your trust in the world. God has made us this way to where we have an empty spot that can only be filled by the Lord Jesus Christ. And then if you reject Jesus Christ, you will try to fill that emptiness with the world and the world will never satisfy all right so by default all these people that reject the Lord Jesus Christ who do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ who do not who who are not born of the Spirit of God all those people they all worship the beast they all put their trust in experts they all put their trust in scientists they all put their trust in Albert Einstein and you know the the political leaders they, they every single one of them hey we gotta make the world a better place why why how are you gonna make the world a better place well we're gonna give our money and support politicians and experts and scientists and they're gonna guide us and astronauts and astronauts are gonna take us to another world and just utter confusion is all that is and it's a vanity because this world is coming to an end the scripture is very clear about that all right the world is coming to an end but all these people they do not want to put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ they want to put their faith in the world so by default all of them that are not saved worship the beast and they all receive the mark upon their foreheads, so their thoughts, their hopes, their dreams, their desires are all in their foreheads and in the work that they do with their hands. The work that they do, they think they're making the world a better place by the work that they do and the thoughts that they have and the conversations that they share with others. That's all that's talking about. It's a spiritual mark. All right, and it's a, really it's a spiritual mark that they give 
themselves. It's not a government official stamping your forehead with a little stamper. You know, click, 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 click. It's not that. And it's not a microchip where a doctor comes in and cuts your hand open or your forehead open and installs a metal device. That's not the, That's not it. Uh, uh, <laughs> but people don't want to believe the simple truth. That's the simple truth. That people don't want to believe the simple truth. All right, and then now this is the big one right here. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now it's important. You see, I got highlighted they and with. So there is a thousand year period where we live and reign with Christ and that's happening right now how can you rightly say that you are saved if Christ is not reigning in your life right now now when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven <clears throat> excuse me when he comes in the clouds of heaven this is the thousand years are over with Right, all this stuff here about the beast and people getting their heads cut off, man, that's done with. It's over. It's the end of the world. We read about this in, you know, Matthew 13. The harvest is the end of the world. You know the parable of the wheat and the tares. We read about this in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. We read about this all throughout the Bible. The end of the world. Daniel 12. Or I'm sorry, Daniel, though he just the whole book in general, but Daniel 12 he talks about the end of the world. After the end of the fourth beast is the end of the world, and then a new kingdom is set up. Uh, it, Bible's consistent all throughout. And it really tells the same thing over and over and over and over. That there's coming an, an end, and when the end of this world comes there's an everlasting kingdom that's going to be set up and we that are born of God live forever in the kingdom of God now the flood of Noah should have showed you that when God destroyed the world by water that should be evidence that God is going to destroy this world by fire All right. now so on one end you have the end of the world all right so at the end of the thousand years there is um, there is uh, you know the end of the this period this time period it's, it's the time periods over okay so the beginning of the time period is when Jesus comes along and he lays down his life as the perfect offering the perfect sacrifice for our sins. All right, so then he rose from the dead. Right? He rose from the dead. All right, the first begotten of the dead. Right? He is the first begotten of the dead. He is the first resurrection. All right, so he rose from the dead and then ascended to heaven with the promise that he will return for us. All right, so this is when the beginning of this thousand years began. Now, it's important to understand that in the Old Testament there was one country, one people of God. All right, there was just one nation of God, one group of people. And outside of the nation of God were the nations deceived. All right? Alright, so outside of the nation of Israel were all these nations that were not the nation of God. They were deceived 
by the devil or by Satan. All right, they were deceived by Satan. And then Jesus comes along and he, he declares it. He declares it that uh, the nation of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay, just so you know that I'm not making this up. This is important to understand all this. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Okay, so Jesus, when he lays down his life, and he offers his body as the sacrifice, the perfect sacrifice to God for the sins of the whole world. So now, whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life you remember back before baby Jesus came along they would offer sacrifices uh, you, you know year by year you know when you week by week or whatever just a, not an expert on exactly how often they would do that but we read here in no, uh, it's not. It's not eleven. Excuse me. I got now. I know where it's at. I think. Hey, I don't know. Um. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Is that what I'm looking for? I believe so. Isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay. All right, so there's more stuff on that. But the, the point is, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. But that's what they were offering to God as a nation, a group of people, a singular nation, a singular group of people, the people of God. Now, the people outside of the nation of God, they were not doing this. They didn't do it. They were not God's people. It was God's people that was offering <clears throat> the blood of bulls and of goats for their sins. But those offerings would never take away sin. It's only by the blood of Jesus. Okay? It's only by the blood of Jesus that our sins can truly be taken away he has washed us from our sins in his own blood all right so during this time that's what they would do they would offer these sacrifices to God the nations outside of the nation of God outside of the people of God they wouldn't they weren't doing that all right they were not doing that so now here comes Jesus and he offers his blood as the perfect sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Now, whosoever liveth and believeth in him shall never perish, shall never die. All right, we have everlasting life. So the kingdom of God is available to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore... There is no longer a, a group of people inside of, <clears throat> of boundaries. The, now the kingdom of God is available <clears throat> to anybody in the world, to whosoever believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. So now Satan is bound. He cannot go out and deceive the nations like he did before. Right? So before, when there was one nation of God, and year by year offering sacrifices, outside of that nation of God were the nations deceived by Satan. Now, when Jesus comes along and makes the kingdom of God available to whosoever believes, now Satan is bound. He, can't, he doesn't have full control over any nation because the nation of God is available to whosoever believes. That means that anybody in the world, anybody can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he can't deceive nations 
No more. He can't deceive him anymore. Now, let's go to when the thousand years are expired, which is the end of the world. <clears throat> okay, excuse me. <clears throat> so, at the end of the world, when Satan is loosed, this is important to understand. Now, this is why I pointed out earlier, study to show thyself approved. We read in uh, Matthew 13, the harvest is the end of the world. So, at the end of the world, the wheat is gathered into his barn, into, the God, into God's barn. And the tares are gathered in bundles and burned. Right? In Revelation, or I'm sorry, in uh, Matthew um, 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, Jesus is asked specifically what is the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and at the end of the world Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven Revelation 1 behold he comes with the clouds and every eye shall see him so in Matthew 24 Mark 13 Luke 21 Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven and every eye sees him and he sends his angels to gather together his elect just like what we read in Matthew 13 the harvest of the wheat and the tares that wheat is gathered into his barn God's barn right <clears throat> and so um, also the, the unsaved are gathered and put in bundles and burned alright so this is the end of the world so at the end of the world we are lifted up Remember what it says in First Thessalonians. Um, yeah, I forgot. Is it four? Yeah. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. So when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, <coughs> excuse me, and we are caught up together with him in the air at the end of the world. All right, so this is consistent all throughout the Bible. We are up in the air. And also in 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, it tells us that we are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. We are changed from mortal to immortal, right? At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. All right, so this is at the end of the world. We are lifted up. We are changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, we are transformed from our corruptible body into our incorruptible body from our mortal body into our immortal body alright this happens at the end of the world so what happens we are lifted up what we read in first Thessalonians we are caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air so we are in the air all of us that are saved are in the air so now think back in the Old Testament when Satan had all these nations to all to himself the only there was only one nation he couldn't touch and that was the nation of God outside of the nation of God he had full control over those nations he could deceive them night and day now fast forward to when Jesus comes and we are lifted up in the air the only people left on earth are the unsaved the nation of God is lifted up and taken out of this world now Satan once again has the power to deceive the nations like he had done before so what's he do he goes out and deceives the nations and gathers them together what we read in Matthew 13 well the wheat are gathered into God's barn right well, hold that thought here let's go where is God's barn it's New Jerusalem right it's new Jerusalem and we read in Galatians somewhere chapter 4 verse 26 but Jerusalem which is above is free which is the mother of us all Jerusalem 
which is above. This is the barn that Jesus is speaking of in Matthew 13. In the harvest of the wheat and the tares. The harvest is the end of the world. At the end of the world, we are gathered into his barn, which is Jerusalem, which is above. Alright, so we are above, we are in the clouds with the Lord to meet the Lord in the air. Alright, so we're going up to the spirit in the sky. That's where I'm going to go when I die, right? So at the end of the world, we are lifted up into the air to meet the Lord. And so now we're up in the air and Satan is at our feet or all the unsaved are at our feet all right all the unsaved are at our feet and all the saved are up in the air all right all everybody that's ever been saved dead and first the dead in Christ then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the Lord uh, in the air to meet the Lord in the air so shall we ever be with the Lord okay so in Revelation 3 verse 9 behold I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee this is all throughout the Bible this scenario of the judgment of God the end of the world this is all throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. So we're going to be up in the air and they're going to come to our feet while we're up in the air and they're going to know that God has loved us. Right? Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Right? Until I make thine enemies thy foot, so that's when we're up in the air with the Lord, and our enemy is at our feet. Alright, and then um, and this goes back to Genesis 3, verse 15. When God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. So, this is when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent and destroying all iniquity forever. All evil, all sin, destroyed forever. This is when death is swallowed up in victory. From Genesis to Revelation, it teaches the same thing. It's consistent all throughout the Bible. So also, in Revelation 20, where it says, They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints of the Bible. Now remember, we're up in the air. All the unsaved are on the earth at our feet. And they compass the camp of the saints about. We're up in the air. We're not on the earth. We're up in the air. Remember what it says in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. We are lifted up in the air. All right, in 1 Thessalonians 4, we are lifted up in the air. First, the dead in Christ and those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. We're up in the air. Remember, Jerusalem, which is above, is free. And the mother of us all, we are up in the air with the Lord at this moment in time. And what happens? Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel, till I make thine enemies thy footstool. This is the end of the world, and not just the end of the world, but the end of all sin the end of death the end of everything evil and wicked it's destroyed forever and ever it's not just the people it's evilness wickedness is destroyed forever all right and on and on and on so i, I hope that makes it pretty clear you know, I'd like to be, if I was an artist, I could draw a picture, I could draw a circle, you know, and then say, okay, inside this circle is the nation of God. Outside of the circle are nations that are deceived by the nation, by, uh, I'm sorry, the, there are nations deceived by Satan. 
And then Jesus comes along and, and he takes away that circle and now whosoever believes in him has everlasting life. Now, then I would like to make another illustration where at the end of the world is when that circle or that city of God or the people of God are taken up and they're up into heaven and all the people on the earth are unsaved people. And so fire comes down from God out of heaven and destroys them all. You know, if I could, if I was a good artist, that's what I'd do, but I'm not. I have a hard time making stick figures. I really do. I can't make them straight and I can't make them look like people. And that's terrible. I'm terrible. Terrible artist. I always have been. But you think of, you know, people in Hollywood, man, they can make amazing images through their lens and their computers and they could tell fantastic stories and people like that but what they don't like is the simple truth of the Bible but that's why I'm here I'm here to teach the simple truth of the Bible and I, I like comments like this these are great comments because now we can talk about these things now we can grow and learn and understand what these things are talking about so if you have any doubts even if you know you're wrong while you're asking the question or making the comment go ahead and say it and let's learn let's grow because this sort of stuff it's not just you know it's probably not doing anything for you but I know it's doing a lot for me it helps me to learn and to grow in the Word of God all right, so I appreciate, I hope you stayed for the whole thing, an ounce of salt per day, because it's pretty simple, man. I, you know, Richie says I made about 30 videos. I, I think it's been a lot more than 30 videos. You know, I could sit here for the next five minutes and scrolling through all the videos that I've made day after day after day after day, week after week after week for I don't know how long. And the reason why I feel so compelled to do this is because there it's it's incredible. It really is. It's incredible. Where I mean it's been six months at least. It might be in a year. Because you look, when you what do we got here? Alright, so when you do a search for this, you see that people are constantly day after day talking about this idea I, I subscribe to these guys what are they talking about they're talking about stuff that they've seen in a Hollywood movie man and they're trying to come up with an ideology based off what they saw on a Hollywood movie called the left behind which is not supported by the Bible whatsoever so I can go on and on and on and on and on day after day week after week month after year you know, on and on and on forever, dear. Nobody listens, but I, I'm hoping someday somebody uh, smarter than me, talks better than me, is a better artist than me, can demonstrate all that sort of stuff better than me. I hope somebody someday catches on, and I've not seen anybody catch on. This is the simple truth of the Bible. It's supported all throughout the Bible, and I and it, to me, it's it's telling of the time that we're living in. When people don't trust the Word of God, they don't trust the Word of God. Instead, they trust what others are teaching. And I'm seeing this all the time. People don't listen to what the Bible says. They listen to what other men say. And they, well, so you got to go back to the early translations. you got to go back to the original language. That tells me that those people don't believe in any Bible at all. Well, the Greek translation or the Greek definition and the Greek word for this or the Hebrew word for this or the Chinese verb for that and, they, and that tells me you don't, you're not believing the Bible that you're holding in your hand that's what it says to me if you believed the Bible that you hold in your hands is from God written in the Spirit of God and written for you written to you and written for you if you believed wholeheartedly with all your heart that the Bible that you have in your hands is from God you wouldn't have any need any desire at all to go look up 
another, you know, what, a dictionary or something? Uh, yeah. Another translation? Another, you, you wouldn't have to go look to somebody else. A man, you wouldn't have to look to go to a man to tell you what God says. You got what God says right there in your hands. And if you believed that, there's no reason to go to somebody else. There's no reason to go to another book if you've got the book of God in your hands. Right, but we live in a world where people don't seem to have any faith at all. I mean, really. When Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, will he find faith on the earth? I mean, you don't think this is a big deal? Think about when Noah was on the earth. How many? I think there was 25 billion people on the earth. I think there was more people on earth then than there is now. Uh, there was not as much water. There was more land and people were living 12 times longer. And they, they were having babies at a very early age until a very old age. That's what their life was about, having children back then. For years and years and years, people were having babies. They didn't stop. It's not like, um, you know, they had population control. They had no control. The world had no control at all. There was a world of massive amount of people. Yet, of all the people that were on earth, only eight were saved. And so, at the end of the world, there were only eight people saved. Do you think about how uh, Abraham pleaded with uh, uh, God about uh, uh, Sodom and Gomorrah? Uh, where, uh, so, if there's only ten, if there are ten righteous, don't, don't kill them. Don't kill them all. If you can find ten righteous. That was the plea bargain. Well, there wasn't ten righteous. God destroyed them all. Right? And so also, at the end of this world, Jesus asked a very interesting question. When the Son of Man comes, shall he find faith on earth? Now, we're promised that there will be um, people being saved for the elect's sakes those days shall be shortened I guess technically um, well I, I don't know but the, the fact of the matter is there won't be very many people saved uh, because I mean, Jesus is saying that the opportunity to be saved is going to be there all the way until the end of the world nevertheless when he comes in the clouds of heaven yeah, shall he find faith on earth? Just to ask that question is amazing. So the question I would ask you is do you believe the Bible that you hold in your hands is from God? All right, so that's a very important question. If you don't believe in the Word of God that you hold in your hands, how can you believe in the Word of God that is in heaven? I mean, you believe that Jesus can raise you from the dead and transform you into a perfect body with no sin, no pain, no sorrow, no suffering, no death. You believe God can do that, but God can't give you a perfect Bible in your language today? And there's something wrong with that. There's something wrong with that viewpoint. That, I mean, that shows a lack of faith. That doesn't show a mountain of faith. That shows a lack of faith. Okay, so I'm going to encourage everybody all the time to trust the Bible, to trust the Word of God, and stop relying on what other men say. You've, you're smart enough. You don't need to be smart. You could be a big-time dummy like me and understand what the Bible says simply by having faith. The key 
to understanding is faith. The key has always been faith. That's always been the the key to understanding, the key to wisdom, the key to everlasting life. It's faith. It's always been about faith. 